Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. So we're going to start out with the currencies uh, because we've seen a bounce here. You can see a bounce in the U.S. dollar. Uh, tremendous rally going on in the Canadian dollar. It's taken a pause. And uh, you can see pretty much across the board um, the dollar is starting to rally a little bit. Now that's reflected in the precious metal. So you can see here uh, gold is now kind of turned down looks like it made a test that we'll see if this continues silver did the same sort of thing uh, palladium had a huge green candle and then a red candle kind of uh, interesting reversal pattern there platinum with the same even copper going down so what's going on well uh, we have to wait and see this might just be a hiccup and the trend continues or this could be a serious reversal um, the the bond market the interest rate markets are kind of looking like they're rolling over going back down that means higher interest rates uh, the two-year note probably is the most bearish out of these you can see that the two-year note never really did rally it just kind of went sideways and now it seems to be rolling over so uh, it looks like interest rates are going to continue upward albeit slowly and then finally the indices the stock market indices you can see here s p 500 clearly going into a new high uh, that's a clear pendant formation breakout into a new high uh russell 2000 is forming into a pennant we would expect that they would follow you can see the euro stocks and the dax uh so uh the financial markets have not slowed down you know looking at the long term i mean the the bull market that we have here it's phenomenal if you look at the month monthly uh, we're talking about six what was on uh s p was it six 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 or something like that uh but uh you know we're up at 24.93 threefold move over the course of we're we're going on eight years going on a 10-year bull market that's going to be one of the longest in history if this thing goes 10 years uh same thing with the nasdaq you can see a huge run from under a thousand to over six thousand we're talking rivaling the nasdaq bubble now so the stocks are in a bubble there's no question about it but big market action in bitcoin and uh we're gonna talk about this doofus diamond this is the diamond drop here uh, Jamie Dimon came out and started trashing on Bitcoin again. I, I don't know if that really caused this sell-off. But you can see I'd been expecting uh, Bitcoin to go down. I sold some more Bitcoin on Coinbase uh, mid-4,000s. And then I started to, uh, with my few funds that I had on Poloniex, uh, some alts that I had converted into Bitcoin, I converted into cash. I've kind of been scaling back in here now. I got out around 4300 into USDT and I've been scaling in, uh, got in around uh, 41, 40, uh, 40, 39, 38. So I'm scaling back in. Now this uh, MACD here, you can see it appears to be close to a reset. Uh, back to the bottom that we had back there in July. If you remember before the Bitcoin hard fork, we had a big uh, correction that went on, brought us down to 1800. And you can see we ran all the way up to nearly 5000. So the MACD is indicating a possible uh, resumption of the bull trend. The major trend line obviously was broken. You can see but uh, now we've got a bounce and then here is the major support line i want you to note that the last time we had a bounce here you can see right there at that 1800 we did not get back down to where the support was so it's quite possible we could actually bounce from here that would be consistent with this pattern a lot of people are expecting 10,000 next i'm not going to say it's out uh, it's not possible it's clearly possible so let's listen to this interview here. J.P. Morgan, uh, J.P. Morgan's Jamie Dimon appeared on CNBC News talking about Bitcoin. And 
you know, one thing really struck me listening to this interview is what an inarticulate kind of doofus this guy is. I mean, everybody thinks of this guy as some kind of financial genius. And we're going to read the Mike Krieger article that shows us that the guy's just fraud. That's the company is just a, a bunch of fraudsters. But just listen to him and listen to how inarticulate he is. Compare him to people in the Bitcoin community like Roger Ver or Andreas Antonopoulos or Mike Voorhees or Trace Mayer or some of the people that you listen to in Bitcoin. And then you listen to this guy. He sounds like a mobster that's, you know, he's drank too many whiskeys or something. So let's listen. Earlier today um, that Bitcoin was a fraud. Yeah. Why is Bitcoin a fraud? Yeah, so separate blockchain, which is a technology, from Bitcoin, the currency. And now there are multiple currencies. And, and, uh, and so I'm talking about not Bitcoin per se. I'm talking about currencies. You know, the first, and the reason, and by, I'm not saying go short, because I know Jim Channis was up there. You know, Bitcoin can tell $100,000 of Bitcoin before it goes down. So this is not a, a advice on what you do. My daughter bought some Bitcoin and it went up, and she thinks she's a genius now. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but it, it's, I did refer to it as like the tulip bulb crisis of the 1700s or whatever. But here's the reason. Governments, the first thing they do is form a currency. They like to control the currency. They control it through a central bank. They also like to know who has it, where it is, where it's going. Okay? And you just saw China just is closing down the Bitcoin exchanges. And what all I ever said is that at Bitcoin, the bigger these things get, the more governments right now they look at it as a novelty. You know, they love in, in, in Washington talk about, oh, this is you know, technology, we love technology. Wait until someone gets hurt. Wait until it's used for illicit purposes, which it is somewhat used for illicit purposes. They close it down. And that's my point. So it's not, you can argue there is, and I also said there's a good reason for it. If you were doing, if you're in Venezuela or Ecuador or North Korea, you're better off probably using Bitcoin than using their currency. That can't possibly be true in the United States unless you're speculating. And that isn't the reason to say something has value because other people are going to speculate. That's TULIP. And that's what I was saying. So I, I don't think, and also, like I said, the, the other reason to close down is because it's used for illicit purposes. And so it's just not a real thing. And eventually it'll be, it'll be the emperor without clothes. I mean, did you pick up on that? Just, he sounded like a inarticulate alcoholic. You know, the TULIP crisis, just the, the lack of knowledge you know, and just the, the poor vocabulary, the slurring of words, you know, that they would trot this doofus out here, this guy. But let's look at Mike Krieger's article here because I was going to do, you know, something on Jamie Dimon, but Mike Krieger did a better job. So I'm just going to read this. This is called uh, Mike Krieger asks, which is fraudulent, Bitcoin or J.P. Morgan? I'm really grateful JP Morgan CEO Jamie Dimon decided to once again lash out in anger at Bitcoin as it provides us with ample opportunity to highlight a practice very near and dear to how the bank operates. Fraud. The way the news cycle works, any topic that isn't already at the forefront of enough people's minds will be largely ignored irrespective of its importance. The fact that Jamie Dimon ironically called Bitcoin a fraud allows us to ask highlights as allows us to highlight some very important facts about the seemingly systemic fraud inherent in America's largest bank JP Morgan first let's take a quick look at some of what Mr. Diamond said courtesy of financial plutocrat network CNBC we just heard that of course he hasn't changed his mind about Bitcoin and he never will as he himself noted back in 2014 um, and by the way, he has, you know, all the way up. And even in this interview, there was another one he mentioned, oh, it could go to 100,000, but it doesn't mean it's not a fraud. Uh, what he once saw as competition, he now seems increasingly terrified of, which is notable in its own right. Beyond that, the most interesting aspect of his recent comments was the use of the word fraud, which provides us with a textbook case of psychological projection. After all, it's there's anything Jamie Dimon seems intimately familiar with it's fraud but don't take my word for it financial journalist and author William Cohen wrote an important piece earlier this month for Vanity Fair titled Jamie Dimon's 13 billion dollar secret revealed 
I thought about sharing it when it was published, but ultimately decided it wouldn't get the traction it deserved. Fortunately, Diamond's Bitcoin commentary has propelled him into the spotlight long enough to turn your attention to this very important piece. Indeed, you can barely read a single paragraph without coming into contact with the word fraud, not in relation to Bitcoin, but in myriad descriptions of routine practices at J.P. Morgan. Here's a few excerpts. In November 2013, J.P. Morgan Chase, the nation's largest bank, agreed to pay a then record $13 billion fine to federal and state authorities in order to settle claims that had misled investors in the years leading up to the financial crisis. J.P. Morgan Chase's settlement raised many eyebrows on Wall Street. The huge settlement appeared inconsistent with the oft-repeated narrative of the bank's heroism during the crisis. People wondered why one of Wall Street's ostensible white knights would pay $13 billion $9 billion of its shareholder cash, plus another $4 billion in mortgage relief in a government case. A number of clues about what had forced Diamond's hand, however, began emerging soon after the conference call. As I reported in The Nation in 2014, J.P. Morgan Chase's settlement came at the end of an intense series of negotiations with a wide range of government officials. Perhaps the most pivotal moment in the conversations occurred in September 2013 when DOJ lawyers shared with Diamond and his attorneys a draft of a 92-page civil complaint that Benjamin B. Wagner, then U.S. Attorney in the Eastern District of California, and his colleagues were prepared to file in federal court. The draft complaint based upon hundreds of thousands of subpoenaed internal J.P. Morgan documents and interviews with its bankers, employees in its mortgage-backed securities division, and third-party mortgage originator alleged that the bank's due diligence process had been subverted and ignored during the years before the crisis. In Wagner's narrative, the bank was not nearly the white knight of Wall Street. No one knew precisely what Wagner's inst investigation had uncovered about J.P. Morgan Chase. However, because his brief was never filed publicly, within weeks of Wagner sharing a draft copy of the complaint with Diamond and following a tense face-to-face meeting at the U.S. Department of Justice between Diamond and Eric Holder, then the U.S. Attorney General, and you remember Eric Holder stated that they're too big to jail. That's what he said about the banks. Uh, meeting with Diamond and Holder, then U.S. Attorney General. The two sides agreed to the $13 billion settlement at the time, the largest ever. has since been surpassed by Bank of America's $16.65 billion fine, settling similar claims. In return, Department of Justice agreed with Diamond and J.P. Morgan Chase, and amongst other things, it would not file Wagner's complaint. Instead, an anodyne 11-page statement of facts was released, but it didn't offer a tremendous amount of insight. There's some banker justice for you. Wall Street CEOs have many reasons for using their shareholders' money to settle nettlesome lawsuits from optics and brand preservation to boosting their stock price and keeping embarrassing facts out of the public hands. And in the wake of his bank's $13 billion settlement, Diamond made clear that he was frustrated that the bank had to settle. At a Microsoft CEO summit, Diamond confessed that he had to control his rage regarding the topic. To keen observers, though, it also seemed that he and J.P. Morgan Chase appeared intent on keeping Wagner's unfiled complaint out of the public record. The specter of the document becoming public was again raised in a separate court case when a few weeks after the Department of Justice announced a settlement with J.P. Morgan Chase, lawyers for the Federal Home Loan Bank of Pittsburgh, which had sued J.P. Morgan Chase's investment bank, along with other defendants, alleging it had sold the bank more than $1.7 billion in squirrely mortgage-backed securities, wanting a copy of Wagner's complaint. In fact, a state judge in Allegheny County, Pennsylvania, ordered the bank to turn over the draft complaint, but J.P. Morgan Chase settled the litigation after the judge's ruling, a settlement that, among other things, included a provision that the draft complaint was to remain private. And then he gives a disclosure about his uh, lawsuit against J.P. Morgan. Now, nearly four years later, as part of a Freedom of Information Act lawsuit initiated by Daniel Novak, an enterprising First Amendment attorney in New York City, the DOJ sent Novak a partially redacted copy of Wagner's curiosity, stoking draft complaint against J.P. Morgan Chase. Novak provided a copy of the partially redacted complaint to me. Quote, by this action, the draft complaint begins. The United States seeks to recover civil penalties against J.P. Morgan Chase and its investment banking arm for, quote, for fraudulent and deceptive scheme to package and sell residential mortgage-backed securities that the bank knew contained a material amount of material defect 
materially defective loans. As the unfiled complaint continued, J.P. Morgan knowingly securitized and sold billions of dollars of mortgage loans that were originated in material violation of underwriting guidelines and law. Perhaps I'm delusional, but I think I saw the word fraud in there somewhere. And he gives another quote from the document. There's that pesky word again twice in one paragraph, but, but, Bitcoin. And he goes on and on about this uh, Wagner document. Not only did the bank view fraud as a key revenue driver, but key employees escaped criminal prosecution and came out like bandits. Indeed, Cohen ends his piece with the following observation. Diamond's pay package for 2013, the year of the big government settlement, was $20 million, a raise of 74% from the year before. Certainly, you say bank executives must have learned lessons from the crisis and reformed their fraudulent ways. Certainly not. Wall Street on Parade did an excellent job of chronicling post-crisis J.P. Morgan fraud. Here are some examples from the post. What J.P. Morgan and Citigroup have in common when it comes to crime. And it just here, here's all the fines. And it's interesting. You remember uh, Diamond was talking about, you know, well, what if... Uh, you know, Bitcoin's used for crime or illicit purposes. Well, this is coming from banks that have been laundering trillions of dollars of drug money, terrorist money. Uh, it's just, it's so laughable. It's ridiculous. And Krieger concludes, in contrast, Bitcoin is the fraud killer. And Diamond must know this. Its code is open source while its supply is capped and distributed in a transparent process. Sure, there are many legitimate criticisms of Bitcoin, but one thing it certainly isn't is fraud. This is what makes Jamie Dimon's commentary so fascinating. He must know deep down that the financial system that has made him so fabulously wealthy is the real fraud, and that Bitcoin and technologies like it threaten that corrupt and destructive paradigm. The more anger Jamie Dimon spews towards Bitcoin, the more confident we should be that we're on the right side of history. Finally, let me end this with, on a more humorous note with a few tweets that perfectly sum up the situation. And here's a tweet that Eric Voorhees gave. My memory is failing. Was it Bitcoin or was it J.P. Morgan that was bailed out by the government? And then we have uh, Crypto Cobain uh, tweeting, Breaking, CEO of Horse and Carriage says cars are a fraudulent scam. <laughs> and then Michael Krieger, his tweet, uh, Jamie Dimon is like a dinosaur talking trash to the asteroid about to hit him. So, uh, Unbelievable. Um, they trot that guy out there and, and honestly I have to use the word doofus because he sounds like a, a drunk uh, he, he can't even pronounce his words clearly he doesn't know the terms he doesn't know how to use them properly uh, he trots out that old blockchain argument you know oh, the blockchain and it's just ridiculous it's absurd so uh, back to Bitcoin uh, I think this may be the bounce. If this MACD turns up, um, we may not get a test of that. If if we do go lower, I would say, you know, if we get down below this point here, then if you're going to look to pick up some Bitcoins and probably put some buys in around 3,100, 3,200, 3,300, because if we do get down to this area, I'm expecting a big bounce. And we'll talk to you next time.